There was a question on the church website recently that asked, what does Virginia Darnell know? Virginia Darnell is our church historian, and believe me, she knows plenty. So just the other day, I called her with a question of my own. I asked, when was the golden age of Richmond's First Baptist Church? She did not hesitate. She said that would have been back during the 1950s and 60s. It was that time, just after World War II, it seemed that everybody was going to church and a lot of people were going to First Baptist Church. There were more than 2,000 people in our Sunday school. And even on a regular Sunday, not Easter, but a regular Sunday, this sanctuary was packed. The ushers would come along and ask people to scoot in toward the center of the pew so they could squeeze in just a few more. And she said, on Sunday nights, if you can believe it, Sunday nights, this place was full and the balcony was full of young people. Can you imagine, she said, can you imagine how it would be if we tried to hold a Sunday night service now? Who would come? That was my question. Who would come? But back then, things were different. Those were the days. It was when Ted Adams was pastor of this church. He was well-known, well-respected. For five years, he served as president of the Baptist World Alliance, and during that time, got his picture on the cover of Time magazine. I can imagine that some people came to First Baptist just because they wanted to see him in person, Dr. Adams, standing at the pulpit. When I talk to people about that time in history, they go on and on about how good it was to be here, how you saw all your friends and neighbors at church, bumped into people in the hallways, ended up talking for hours. Some of them assure me that back in those days, everybody tithed and everybody gave to missions and everybody came on Wednesday nights. Probably not, but <laughs> it's the way we remember it. We sift through those memories and hold on to the ones we love. And we remember that time as the golden age. It sounds a lot like today's reading from the book of Acts, which describes the golden age of the early church. If you could ask somebody who had been there during those days, they would have said, oh yes, what a wonderful time that was. Peter and those other apostles were doing signs and wonders. Lame people were being healed. Blind people could see. Deaf people could hear. It all fell upon everybody. And those of us who were there sat at the feet of the apostles day after day, just soaking it in, drinking it up. We wanted to hear everything they could tell us about Jesus. When we got hungry, we ate. When we needed to pray, we prayed. We were all together. We had all things in common. Why? We sold everything we had and turned over the money to the apostles. And then if anybody needed anything, they would take care of it. But in those days, it seemed that all we really needed was God. More and more of God. We spent hours in the temple. And then we would gather in each other's homes for a kind of potluck supper. People would just bring what they had and we ate whatever they brought with glad and generous hearts. We praised the Lord and we loved the people and everywhere we went, people had good things to say about us and day after day, the Lord added to our number those who were being saved. It was as if everybody wanted some of what we had. Was it really like that? Probably not. But this is the way people remember these things when they look back. When Jesus asked his disciples in those days when they were traveling around together, what was the golden age of Israel? They could tell him. That was the time when David was king. When the borders of Israel were extended in every direction. When we had rest from our enemies all around. When David was king, he made Jerusalem his capital and he brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city. David danced before the Ark. He was leaping and whirling in only his linen ephod so that when his wife looked out the window and saw him, she was embarrassed for him and for herself. She said to him later, 
You made a fine spectacle of yourself today, dancing around half naked in front of all the young women of Jerusalem. And David said, it was before the Lord that I danced. Do you see? The disciples would say, we've never had a king like that since then. Never had someone who loved the Lord so much. And you can see the results. They didn't have to elaborate. Jesus knew what had happened in Israel, how they had been carried off into captivity, how they had wasted away there for years and years, and when they returned and tried to rebuild, how discouraged they were that Israel could never achieve its former glory. They began to wait and pray that someday God would send His Messiah, the one who would be a descendant of King David and rule as He had ruled over the nation. And that's why some people were so excited about Jesus. He seemed to have all the qualities of that kind of king. He was a prophet, mighty in word and deed. When he went around Galilee teaching and healing, he drew great crowds so that by the time he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, thinking maybe this is the one we have been waiting for. Hoping that he would be the one to ascend the throne of David and run out that occupying Roman army and restore Israel to its former glory. But Jesus had a different mission than that. And even if nobody else understood it, He did. After He was raised from the dead, one of His own disciples, who should have known better, asked Him, Lord, will You at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said to him, essentially, that's none of your business. That's God's business. Your business is to be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, which should have been a hint that God's plans were much bigger than any single nation. Maybe they should have gotten that hint when Jesus called His disciples in the first place. He called 12 of them. Do you remember? 12 men. People ask me sometimes why he didn't call at least a few women. They were always part of his ministry, always in that inner circle. But Jesus called 12 men, I think, in part to make it obvious that he was doing something new. If he had been trying to restore the kingdom of Israel, he might have called 12 men because Israel was made up of those 12 tribes named after the 12 sons of Jacob. If Jesus had been trying to restore Israel, He would have called some disciples named Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah. He would have made it clear that this is what He was trying to do. But instead, He called disciples with names like Peter and Andrew and James and John. He wasn't trying to bring back the old kingdom of Israel. He was trying to bring in the new kingdom of God. And everywhere he went with those disciples, he talked to them about that kingdom. He trained them for its work, told parables about lost sheep and lost coins and lost sons, about treasures hidden in fields and pearls of great price. He said, when the kingdom finally comes, the last will be first, the least will be great, which should be a clue that Jesus wasn't trying to restore the old order. That kind of thinking turns the old order on its head, turns the world upside down, which is what I think Jesus was after. You may remember that when God brought His people out of captivity in Egypt, He led them to Mount Sinai and there made His covenant with them. He said, if you will be My people, then I will be your God. When I talk about this event, I sometimes refer to it as the wedding in the wilderness. And the Ten Commandments that God gave them function as wedding vows. You can almost see Moses standing there in front of the people and saying, will you, Israel, have God and no other God before Him? Will you make no false idols? And will you not take His name in vain? Will you remember His special day and keep it holy? And of course, they all said, we do. We will. 
When you look at those Ten Commandments closely, you see that they are all about relationship, our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. Moses might have just as well said to the people afterward, and will you promise not to kill each other, not to lust after each other's wives, not to steal from each other, not to covet each other's possessions, will you? And of course they said, we will. But Israel proved to be an unfaithful bride. Years later, Jesus would have to say, what God wants from you, His people, is what He has always wanted, love. He wants you to love Him with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. He wants you to love your neighbor just as much as you love yourselves. And that's why this particular passage in Acts is so interesting to me because it appears that God has finally gotten just what God always wanted. Listen. After the Holy Spirit came upon those believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. Day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. If what happened at Sinai was the wedding in the wilderness, then what happened at Pentecost was the honeymoon. God finally got what He wanted. People who loved Him and loved each other. And it didn't look much like the old kingdom of Israel. It looked like the new kingdom of God. It looked as if heaven had finally come to earth. Now that would be a good place to end the sermon, wouldn't it? And I could, except there are two lessons from this episode in the book of Acts that I think we need to make sure we have learned. And number one is this. Membership in the church of Jesus Christ is open to anyone who believes in Him. That's an important thing to know. As wonderful as those days were at First Baptist Church during the 50s and 60s, there were some people who were not allowed to join this church during those days. As wonderful as things were in Israel during the time of King David, membership was limited to the sons and daughters of Abraham. In a very real sense, both of those communities, ours and theirs, were exclusive. Some people who were not allowed. But here, in Acts 2, we have a picture of a community where everybody who believes in Jesus is welcome. Parthian, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia. And as the story goes on, that kind of Gracious inclusiveness becomes even more evident. Philip goes off and begins to preach to the despised Samaritans. Some of them believe the good news and are saved. He also preaches to an Ethiopian eunuch of all people on that road down near the Gaza Strip who asks him, here's water, what's to keep me from being baptized? Well, in the old days, there would have been plenty, but now, now that God's Spirit has come, now that the door of the church is open, why not, Philip says, baptizes him. Peter is almost forced by the Holy Spirit to go to the home of Cornelius, a Gentile, and to preach the good news to him so that Cornelius and his whole family receive salvation and are baptized. Near the end of this book, Paul is going all over Asia Minor and into Europe, preaching the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. People are believing and receiving, and everywhere he goes, revival breaks out. 
It's said about Paul and Silas in Acts 17 that these are two of those who are turning the world upside down. Do you see? That's what Jesus was after. That sort of thing. Jesus' mission was much bigger than His disciples imagined. He wasn't simply restoring the kingdom of Israel. He was creating this new kingdom of God. Maybe that's why He says in John's Gospel, I am the gate for the sheep. Maybe He knew that if you leave the gatekeeping up to us, there are some sheep we will always keep out. But if you leave it up to Jesus... He will swing the gate open for anybody who believes in Him. I wrote it up in my notes like this early last week. God is not restoring the kingdom of Israel, but through His Son Jesus creating the kingdom of God. And it is open to everyone who believes in Him, to everyone who repents and is baptized, to everyone who receives the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the gate, and the gate is open in a way it has never been before. The Holy Spirit is the power that makes perfect relationship possible. And the Father is the creator of this new community. And then I wrote this with a little smiley face beside it. Won't you come in? The second important lesson we need to learn from this passage is this. That the church is not the goal, but the tool of God's mission. I want to point out to you that this picture of perfect community is in Acts chapter 2, not Acts chapter 28. It is in so many ways the beginning and not the end of the story of God's mission. I really do think that we are learning this lesson these days in this church and that God wants to use us to turn the world upside down. Those believers went out from that perfect church in Acts chapter 2 and became witnesses for Christ in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We too are learning that God's purpose is not to get us all into the same building, but to bring in God's kingdom. I looked out over the 830 congregation this morning, which was small, and thought, you know, It wouldn't have been like that back in the 50s and 60s. Back then, if we had gathered at 8.30 in the morning, this place would have been full. When I looked out and saw so few people there at 8.30, well, it brought me down a little bit. Until I thought about it like this. I thought, what if I looked at those people and thought of them not as members, but as missionaries? And when I did, my heart began to beat faster because I looked out over that crowd of missionaries and thought, good gracious, if we turned these people loose on the city of Richmond, we would turn it upside down. We would, wouldn't we? It would change everything. Suppose we did that. Suppose that every member at the 11 o'clock service thought of himself or herself as a missionary and not just a member. Suppose we went out from this place week after week determined to do our part to turn the world upside down. If we did, I think we would stop looking back to the 50s and 60s and saying those were the days. I think we would start saying these are the days. Right here. Right now. Look what's happening among us. God is bringing in the kingdom. In the same way those early believers became witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, those of us in this room could become witnesses in Richmond, in Ryko, Hanover, Chesterfield, until God's will was done in this part of the world, until God's kingdom comes here on earth as it is in heaven. So may it be, and so may we pray. Gracious God, thank you for calling us to bigger things than a full sanctuary. 
Thank you for helping us dream your dream of a changed world. We ask you to fill us up with your Holy Spirit and send us out to do what we cannot do on our own. Give us the power to touch and change the lives of people around us, to be your faithful witnesses in such a way that your will is done. Your kingdom does come here on earth as in heaven. This is our prayer, and we make it in your name. Amen.